everyone and welcome back to another uh, another episode of our Roto webinar series with Dr. Leo Yang. Once again, I am Dan MacArthur, the product manager here at the Orem Group. Um, the Orem Academy is really excited for this uh, seminar here uh, on the simple methods for better patient treatment acceptance. We're going to go over um, some tried and true methods um, to help you get over the hump for those cases that are not just a single one and two uh, implant cases, but for a full quadrant or even a full arch. Um, little tips and tricks for both you and your staff to get that acceptance up there. Uh, without further ado, I will hand this off to uh, Leo. Thank you, thank you. So um, as you know, this is part of the Road Auto RM seminar or webinar series, as you know, this one and the last one is not really touched much about Roto, but we thought maybe this would be something that would benefit all of us, or at least it did benefit me when I was first starting out or at least practicing. And today, basically, I'm going to share with you some of my techniques of basically how to communicate with patients so that patients can accept treatment that is on a higher level from maybe quadrant work to more complex work. And Basically, if you use the similar same techniques, I know it works. And um, if you want to copy it exactly how I do it, go for it. Uh, but if you want to take little pieces and bits and pieces of it and then implement it in the way you do it, then uh, go for that. Go for it also. But the idea here is to not get too technical, not get with all these fancy equipment and stuff like that, and just basically have some simple good photography and just have some good verbal skills to be able to communicate patients. And you'll find out that basically patients probably, it's not gonna be that difficult to really uh, do more of your quadrant cases and things like that versus your single unit. So to start off with, again, just to tell you about myself in case you haven't heard of me or you haven't seen me before, I run a full digital practice in Mill Valley, California, which is outside of San Francisco Bay Area. I'm a wet finger dentist also, which means that I do test things for companies and things like that and see if it works in a clinical setting. And so if it doesn't work, then basically I give them my feedback and the whole idea is to, for me to make the mistakes and not you to make the mistakes. Part of the CERIC training team and the KOL, KOL and Splicerona and the Roto Clinical Advisory Board. Disclosure again, yes, Arm is paying me to speak on this behalf of the webinar today, but I just want to be clear about it in that this is the things that I'll be showing you are actually my cases. And these are things I do on a regular basis, which means that if you didn't even pay me to talk about this, these are things that I do and use and materials I use also on a daily routine basis. So um, really, I feel like, you know, I feel true to myself. With that said, then um, let's just briefly talk about what we're going to be touching base on today. Uh, so what I'm really sharing with you is really my own success formula, and I know it works because this is something that has um, that that I'm doing it still as of now, even today, actually. And um, and however, some of the things that we'll be talking about, or at least I'll be sharing with you, is about really nothing new. Uh, for me, it's been years of watching and learning from doctors like yourself, because when I train people, I watch and take up little pros and cons of each practices and implement to my practice and um and then doctors like self to coaches and successful people and presenting in a way so it's easy for patients to understand and connect with them the key is connection really if you, if, if you really sit through this today there's really no hard sell and the reason why I'm, I'm really actually quite excited about this webinar today because this has actually been the 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 area that impacted me the most in regards to my practice is because without these skills, I wouldn't be able to do all these other things such as the quadrants to implant dentistry, to roto stuff, to aesthetics and stuff like that. So I feel like this area is the one that has impacted me the most and that allowed me to really connect with people to do the work that I really believe in and truly love, as well as helping people also. So my goal here is really for you to succeed faster than me and avoid the same mistakes, the painful mistakes that I made in the past. You know, I feel like in some ways we don't need to make the same mistakes. So as long as you know what not to do, then you'll notice that you will probably get there much faster, which is great. You're more than welcome to copy how I do it or just take parts of it and just incorporate it into your own style. 
you will soon realize by doing all these things, you will develop your own style in the future. So comprehensive dentistry here. I mean, for us here, if you look at it, I'm getting my numbers better now in, in Canada terms. I believe this is, a, if I look at 1.7, which is a second molar, okay? So typically when you look at something like that, you have decay in the distal portion of that 1.7 around the mountain filling. And I suspect that most of us in our practice, when we make recommendations for patients, usually for these single tooth issues or restorations, usually it's not an issue. Patients usually go ahead and do it. However, when there are cases that where it doesn't hurt for the patients and you feel like, you know, patients are, should really consider doing it, as well as if you look at the surrounding now, there's really decay on that 1.8 on the third molar. You can see the composite on the 1.6 is starting to break down, as well as this old amalgam on the 1.4. So really, if you think about it, okay, in an ideal perfect world, the patient could really benefit from a quadrant type of work. Of course, they don't have to do it all at once, but you know, there's benefits of doing quadrant work also. So in our heads, a lot of times, if you don't have the skills to really communicate with patients, you start asking yourself, well, how am I supposed to talk to patients? Okay, we tend to have a fear of also when we say something, they might think that we're selling and then there's a fear that they might reject us also. So there's a lot of these things, at least for me back in the days, I was wondering why. As a good clinician, I thought maybe everyone should do all the dental work I recommend, but the reality is that they didn't. And I was having a hard time at the beginning getting patients to accept them until I figure out this workflow that I'll be sharing with you today. So in regards to comprehensive dentistry, I think definitely a lot of us will really benefit from it by, you know, if you can, do more of these quadrant work. So common thoughts from the patient side when you start having these type of conversations is that typically in their heads, if you don't have a way to connect with them, they typically will do or think, say things like in their heads, say, do I really need it, you know? Another thing that we we'll say is, is would be something like is a doctor telling the truth about the recommendations, stuff like that. The best thing I hear all the time, at least in the past, is that they will say things like, oh, I'm paying for the doctor's house, I'm paying for the tuition, paying for the car and stuff like that. And I think we've all heard that in the past. Another thing that really comes up in their mind is that, well, it doesn't hurt to me, so do I really need it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the common thoughts that patients typically think about, I think. Um, especially when you talk about recommendations to the patient. And the key is to really eliminate all these guesswork or at least all these things that thoughts in their head. And like I said, I'll be sharing with you some of my techniques with you today so that, you know, it, the whole idea is to avoid patients to think this way. Now, the whole idea also is to make sure that we as dentists don't get technical. For some reason, as dentists, we're trained to be very technical and get into all these little details when we explain things. The reality is that, you know, for example, when you see an issue on an x-rays, it may look common to you, but a lot of times patients don't really know what they're looking at still. And so it's a matter of just them trusting you. So instead of getting technical about the explanation you have and losing them or not necessarily connecting with them, the key is to move down te technical and like, like I said, I will be showing you techniques or at least ways to really stay away from that. So what does that mean? The, what that means is that you really have to think the difference between left brain and right brain. Um, if you're not familiar with this, left brain is really the logical side of your brain, which means that you're talking about languages, numbers, and analytical thinking. The creative, creative part is your right brain, is the expression, emotion, intelligence, and imagination. And what we need to do is that when, whenever we communicate with patients, we really, really need to talk to patients on the right brain side. And, and what are some of the tools that we use to really stay on the right brain side? Is to really show photos of existing issues of teeth in this case. Or if you don't like photos, you could do digital impressioning and show and walk them through that. And the key also is that when you have these conversations with patients to really get with um, non-technical words, okay? So on the left side, what is the left side of the brain when it regards to dentistry? It's talking about cost of the treatment, the treatment plan details of all these codes and stuff like that. 
takes race as a technical side. We start thinking, talking about stuff like that, and also like pair of pocket numbers. These are the technical sides. And a lot of times, even though it makes sense to us, is obvious to us, a lot of times it is not so obvious to the patient. So with that said, then let's go into cases now, because the key is to really show you cases and how I really talk to patients. And once you see how I communicate with patients, then you'll realize that, you know, it's actually not that difficult, okay? So let's look at an example here on one six. Um, this is the first molar with an existing silver filling with discoloration around it crack lines on lingual, distal, and the mesial portion that's broken. Very common things that you see on your patients. Now, this is to be a patient, let's use an example. This is a patient that does not have any pain, but obviously you see things to be not great and you think that patients should treat it. So because the patient has no pain, he or she is not gonna think that they're gonna need anything. So the question now is, how do you really talk to the patients in regards to saying, well, okay, you should really treat this one six, for example, okay? So what I do is that typically, what I do is that I take quadrant photos like this. Now, if you know how I do things, I document every case. I'm not asking you to do this, but I document every case, So, which means that a lot of times I take these routine quadrant photos. Quadrant photos is not using an intro or camera taking a photo of one tooth or one tooth next to it. You need a series of photos. You need a photos that has a series of teeth in that view so that patients can really appreciate things and see overview. So what I typically do is I would have a quadrant photo like this, okay? So whenever I have a quadrant photo like this, it could be me taking it or it could be an assistant team member taking it. And what I'm going to give you an example of how I walk through is this. I'm going to put this picture up. Patient, just say Anne is here for an exam after a cleaning. So a picture like this would be taken or put up to like big screen on the chair. And so what happens is that when it's put up to the chair, then typically I will either walk out for around five minutes and do another exam on another hygiene patient or like my staff thinks, they think I'm watching YouTube videos in my breaks all the time. So what you need to do is take a picture, let the patient look at it, let them absorb it, walk away. During that time, you've noticed that at that time, the patient will start looking at the tooth and evaluating on their own what they think about the tooth, okay? And then what happens is then after around five minutes, just say your other hygiene check, you come back in and you say, hey, I'm ready for the exam. And Anne will typically say something first. She'll typically say things like, hey, doc, that tooth doesn't look good, right? And so what I typically would say things would be, yeah, Anne, I agree with you. It doesn't look great. So then Anne, I'm going to be role-playing now. So Anne would be saying, well, doc, sh sh should I do something about it? And I would say something like, well, does it hurt you? Anne's going to say no. And so and I would say, well, in a perfect ideal world, I would fix it. The reason why is because with also fillings like this, typically there's decay around it over time, especially when it's old. But when you see the discoloration around the silver filling, I guarantee you that when I take the silver filling out, there's gonna be decay underneath it. Plus you see this portion right here on this, this side where I'm circling, there's a break in the tooth also. So I won't be surprised if there's decay underneath it. Then Anne will typically say then how I'm gonna fix it. Then I will say something like this. I will say, well, in this case, usually when I clean up the tooth and remove the decay and filling, the hole is gonna be relatively large. And if I'm gonna draw around it, the perimeter is gonna be approximately this sort of size. And I literally would go my cursor around the tooth. And I said, well, when I remove it, it's gonna be a relatively large hole. But so whenever there's a hard hole, I like to use material stronger so it can last longer. And typically I'll use material like porcelain like a crown, uh, like a material of a crown, but not like a crown, but it's the same material as a crown. The patient Anne would say things like then, well, is it a crown then? And I said, well, no, in my practice, I typically don't do a lot of crowns. I like to preserve as much tooth as possible. And would be this would be sort of like a partial crown or we label it as a three quarter crown. But think of it as like an insert that goes into that space, a custom mill piece that goes right into the tooth. Ah, I see. 
then Anne would typically say then after that would be things like, well, how much does it cost? And I'll say approximately for something like this in porcelain, it's going to be around, just going to make up some number, $1,300. And then what happens after that is that you don't say anything, you're going to let Anne think. Because in her head, she's going to think $1,300, and then she's going to think in her head if she can afford it or not. Because if you think that she can afford it, she's going to ask, and the next question would be, well, can I see an estimate so that maybe I can consider scheduling this, right? So then if she cannot afford it, she's either going to say, no, I'm not going to do it now, and maybe you not know, do it later, which you should respect and not push them to do it. Or they might say, well, do you have maybe a payment plan? And things like that. I'm not going to stress too much on a payment plan, but they might say that. So you might need to have a solution for that. But the other option is that after that is that you said that is $1,300, then typically Anne will say something like, does insurance cover this? And I will say things like, yes, insurance usually cover this. Just expect yourself to have a co-pay. And then Anne goes, oh, okay. And if Anne is interested, then what happens is that once Anne is interested, she will say again, can you write me an estimate for that? And then I say, okay, so once um, once Andrea has an estimate for it, and if you decide you want to proceed, then we'll take care of this for you. So I go through that process, very non-technical, and then what happens is that really you, you get to explain things to the patient in a very simple way. But also what I did there is that when I quote numbers, which I'm very comfortable with, okay? Because I know some doctors are not comfortable quoting numbers. I'm very comfortable quoting numbers. And part of that is for me is to really screen you to see if you're really ready for that, you know? Because if you're not ready for that, there's no point in putting that treatment plan together. Because if I try to put a treatment plan together, then I'm just going to like jam it down your throat and just make you mad. Or uh, in other words, I'm pre-qualifying you in this case. Or the other thing is that when I actually gave that number to you, you will be able to know if you can afford it or not. And once you know you can afford it, when the actual staff member gives you a treatment plan, which is gonna be very similar to the number I quoted you, then it's not gonna be any surprises. And when there's no surprises, then it's more likely they're gonna sign a treatment plan and schedule. The only thing I didn't give in detail was the estimate, which is fine because at the end of the day, as long as you give the total number, that's the number you have to give them because then at least they know if it's something they can afford. So that's a typical conversation with my patients. Yes, I spent around five minutes of that, but what's gonna happen is that as you have these conversations with patients, you'll notice that on the next case with Anne, you don't have to spend so much time talking anymore because Anne understands because she's gone through this. So that's my initial conversation for people to really consider accepting uh, treatment plan. Now, once they decide they're gonna do it and decides to do it, I do take subsequent photos, series of photos. Now I take series of photos from remove pre-op to removing sewer filling, to final preps, to final bonding. I do that on a regular basis because I do a walkthrough at the end with them, okay? So just imagine Anne now is in the chair, Everything is taken care of and everything is start to complete it. And so what happens is that I will show the pre-op picture, which is previously, then I'll show a picture like this now. And then, and, and I'll just not say anything and I'll just leave it there on the screen. And then, so typically what Anne will say would be something like, oh, that is disgusting. That is gross. And I will say to Anne, I agree with you. That's the reason why we should do it because there's decay, so much decay here. And so notice that there's decay on this portion of the tooth. There's decay there. You see these crack lines and chip. And so this is the reason why I recommend to have it fixed. So what the reason why I do this is to reinforce now why I made that recommendation is that actually I'm not lying to you anymore because there's actually decay. The next picture then I'm going to be showing is I usually don't take progress pictures but usually I'll take a final prep picture. As you can see in the bottom, the next picture I'll be showing to Anne will be the final prep picture. And the Anne will typically say and ask me questions like, well, is that still decay around here? And I say, oh, I would typically say, no, it's not decay. It's basically areas that were very deep, but usually it's probably the tattooing effect from the silver film, but it's still solid and no decay. 
However, Anne, I just want to point out to you that some of these areas are close to the nerve. And there's a small percentage that down the road, the nerve might become a problem for you. The odds are very small, but I just want to let you know that there's a possibility. The reason why I have that conversation is that although the possibilities or the odds are small, like I said, there is sometimes that sometimes these cases because becomes end or involved. And especially if the tooth has not hurt the patient, a lot of times when the tooth becomes a problem with a nerve problem and a root canal problem, typically sometimes patients in their head will think that, well, it's your fault because I didn't have any pain before. But by showing the process of basically prepping so deep and close to the nerve, they will sort of not like it still, but they will accept the fact that, well, the decay was deep and that's why you need a root canal. And that's part of the reasons why I walked them through this also. Then the final picture is I'm going to show them something like this, where everything is bonded in. And of course, I usually will put a side by side before and after also. So what that does is that it reinforces that whatever this was recommended was done, and that there was the reason why it was done, and there's value there. And so that is my usual sequence in regards to how I treatment plan and discuss with patients. One is to I always have a pre-op nice photos to talk with patients about it. Number two is to really walk through it once you have this procedure and to walk them through to show them basically the decay because they will always remember decay, okay? And they will remember what it looks like. And then number three is that they will also remember really how big a preparation is. And that's the reason why maybe you recommend a porcelain versus a filling because a lot of times patients will say, can you just not fill it in this case? There's a reason why you did it in porcelain. And then show them the final product in regards to how aesthetically it's much nicer than the pre-op, which is in Malibu. So that is my usual sequence. So then just to summarize now, okay, during the consultation or exam sequence, the key is to take a quadrant photo. Now I'll be showing you a little bit, I'll talk about later that you don't have to have any fancy equipment. You can just go with some basic equipment now, at least with modern technology. You can take a quadrant photo. It's either you or a team member can do it. The key here also is to, once the photo is taken, care, taken either by a team member or you, to walk away for, from it because you want the patients to start looking at it and dissecting. I can guarantee you the worse it looks, the more they're going to dissect it. And once they dissect it, they have, will have an opinion in their head about what they think it is, and they will start asking questions, okay? When you come and return, let the patient speak first. We as dentists, in my opinion, always talk too much. We have to really stop talking and talking too much. And a lot of times I feel like we talk so much that we actually sell ourselves out of the treatment in this case. Then we have to learn to just really shut up and not talk too much and let the patient speak. But in this case, when you return back from looking at the picture is to make sure that you let the patient speak first. You don't talk, you let them speak first. Then when they talk, they're gonna ask you questions and let them ask you questions. The reason why is that most people like to feel like they're in control of things. And what you wanna do is that by them asking questions, they are in control, but really, Yes, they're in control. You're guiding them through that process, okay? And then also what happens is that when you have quadrant pictures, if there's surrounding teeth with issues, it will give you an opportunity to talk and report facts of the surrounding teeth also, which will raise that opportunity to talk about potential quadrant work now. So I don't know if you get this. This is the reason why I do quadrant pictures that gets them to see. Now you'll find out at the beginning here, okay? Cause you're gonna learn how to do this. It's gonna take you time. It's gonna take you time to get used to talking to people. You spend more time in the beginning with every new patient that you haven't done it before. But you've noticed that once after you start to do treatment on Anne in this case, really in the future, you don't have to spend so much time talking to Anne about all these anymore because Anne is used to that flow. And so a lot of times Anne will say things like, oh, I don't need to look at the picture anymore. What do I need doc? To, if they still want to look at the pictures again, it's fine. You walk them through, but it could be a much quicker walk through. So you'll notice that future treatment recommendations will be much shorter. Now, post-treatment, the key to post-treatment is to really do a walkthrough. And when I do a walkthrough with the case, then um, once I have it done, um, they patients will typically also 
especially if we haven't done more than one tooth, they will ask questions on other teeth also. They will ask things like, Doc, what do you think about this other tooth next to it? Okay, it gives you that opportunity. What happens is by doing this, really by doing things that's non-technical and no hard sell, you're building trust. By doing this also is that I know that patients may not like the process, but eliminates any guesswork about if I'm telling the truth about why you should do it, or if I'm telling the truth that if there was decay in that tooth, or if I'm telling the truth why the prep was so deep, that's why we did in porcelain versus composite, and that why maybe it needed endo, okay? We really eliminate that. And the whole idea is to eliminate that and have trust. Another time, another thing that I do is that before cementation, when the restoration comes back from arm, for example, like a picture here in the bottom here, this onlay or three quarter crown, I typically, what I do is that before I cement it, I will actually put in their hands and let them touch it and feel it. Now, most of the people will do that. Some people don't want to touch it and they don't want to touch it, that's fine. But what happens is that the key to letting them touch it is to build value, but also is to also reinforce that, okay, this is what I pay for. It's almost like touching a piece of jewelry. It reinforces that, wow, this is what I'm paying for. Although it's very expensive, but at least it reinforces that, what we, why we did and what we did, which they pay for. And again, like I said, in the future treatment, you'll, require, you'll understand, you'll realize that you're not going to require so much time explaining things and which will open up future treatment, complex work, aesthetic works to quadra work and things like that. So what you realize is that later on, there are patients that may not need that, but what I try to make sure you do is start, keep on doing the sequences, taking pictures, because you want to reinforce that basically, you know what, patients is trusting you. You don't want to really lose that trust, because once you lose that trust or guess work in regards to, hey, is the doctor really doing it on my best interest? Then you know what, sometimes it's just very difficult. So I feel like, you know, by continuing doing this all the time, it reinforces that trust and it builds value also and also eliminates any guesswork. Now, look at case number two. This is 2-6 with an existing silver filling with distal decay on the x-ray. And again, I'm putting, just say Joshua here now. I'm putting a picture of Joshua's teeth up there. And then I walk away, I come back, and Joshua will say something like, Doc, I'm going to go through role play again. Joshua will say, Doc, this tooth doesn't look that great, right? And he's pointing to the silver filling. I say, yeah, it's not looking too great. The reason why I want to put this up is that because on the x-rays, on the back portion, you see this discoloration there. I see discoloration there because there's decay on the x-rays. And whenever I see decay on x-rays, or at least visually, then I usually recommend patients to really get it treated because it'll get worse. Oh, patient Joshua might say, well, it doesn't hurt. Well, I said, well, it doesn't hurt. And that's the reason why I take pictures, take x-rays and do an exam because sometimes, you know, pain is not the only source of problem of why we should do work. And I just want to let you know, since we're around here, you have a composite around the same tooth here and there could be decay around there also. And Joshua's going to say, oh, okay, what should I do about it? I said, well, Joshua, when I prep this tooth and clean this tooth out, typically when I prep it, it's going to be something along the lines of this sort of preparation. So the hole that I'll be drilling out, it's going to be approximately on the larger side. And then whenever I restore teeth that on the larger size hole, I like to use stronger material called porcelain. Wow. Again, Joshua might say, well, porcelain, is it the same as a crown? I go, actually, it's the same material as a crown. And then Joshua will say, well, is it a crown then? I said, no, it's not a crown. It's going to be sort of like a insert or a custom piece that we're going to mill out that fit into the space. But we're not going to shave the whole tooth. But it's going to be similar to, uh, and it's not going to be similar. It's actually going to be the same material as a crown. And then Joshua is going to say things like, well, does insurance cover this? And I will say the same thing. Joshua yes, the insurance will typically cover this if you have insurance. Just expect yourself to have the copay. But in this case, Joshua, I just want to let you know, for billing purposes, when you see a trim plan, typically we label it as like a three-quarter crown or an onlay. I just want to let you know it's not a crown. Think of it as just an insert. It's just labeled that way in the trim plan. 
but it's not going to be a crown. It's like an insert or a partial crown. Then Joshua's going to say, oh, okay. So and Joshua will say, well, what's the total cost of this, for example? And I'll say, well, the total cost of this is going to be around $1,300. Again, if Joshua thinks it's going to be going to afford you, he's going to say, okay, let's give me a trim plan and let's uh, let's schedule. Or Joshua will say, well, how much is insurance going to cover this? And I will say, well, Joshua, I don't exactly know. I just know the total cost. But if you want to really see an estimate of what the insurance will cover, I'll be more than happy to get Andre to come up with you for that. And Joshua will say, okay. So then with that then, again, once Andres presents a true plan to Joshua, the only thing is that if he can afford the copay or not. And if he can, since the total cost is the same, then it's going to be quite easy for Joshua to decide in regards to if he wants to treat this 2-6. Now, if patients, when during this discussion, if patients are really observant, they will say something like, well, Doc, next to it on the gold crown, is there something going on? Right? Because really, if you look at closer, there's a hole right here. Okay? Now, if patient's not observant, then I would say something like during my examination process, I would say, Joshua, since we're here, can I point something out to you on the gold crown? Usually, patients like Joshua will say yes. I said, I just want to point this out to you that around this gold crown, there's a hole there. And Joshua will say, what does that mean? It just means that, Joshua, that when you see a hole there, there's a possibility that decay is leaking or creating underneath that hole. It may not be yet, but it will be eventually. If it's there already, but eventually it will become decay. Then Joshua will say, how should I fix it? Well, I say in a perfect world, yes, you can leave them and not do it, but it's probably suddenly become a problem down the road. But in a perfect world, the best thing to do is to cut off the crown and put a new crown on. I see. And Joshua might say, well, is there an alternative? I said, well, there is an alternative. The alternative is to really patch it by maybe drawing, drilling a small area here and patching that. But Joshua, I just want to let you know I'm not a big fan of patching because patchwork is something that buys you time. And a lot of times when we do that, you never know if all the decay has been cleaned out, if there's decay. Ah. And then Joshua will say, well, how much is this going to cost? I said, well, it's actually really the same cost of the one next to it. So it'll be around $1,300 also. Now, at this point, if Joshua can afford it in his head, because he's going to think in their head they can afford it or not. If they can afford it, they're going to say, well, I think I'm going to get done at the same time. So if it is, then all we need to do is have Andrea come on the trim plan. But if Joshua cannot afford it because they only need to concentrate on 2.6 only and not 2.7, then what I would typically do is I would say, Joshua, since this is an ongoing problem, I'm just going to notate it into my chart so that I know that this is something that we should really watch and pay attention to it because this is something that you might to treat down the road. You want to make sure you have this conversation and notate that so Joshua remembers that also. But the whole idea, again, to this picture here is to really, by showing the picture, allows you to open the opportunity from doing one single tooth on 2.6 versus possibility 2.6 and 2.7. Okay? And that starts with picture and having this conversation. So once I've established that, again, we're going to do the walkthrough again, right? As I do the walkthrough, I'll show before, which is on the top left side. I will typically show a prep initial picture of amalgam removal or composite removal to show the decay. And again, when patients sees that, especially women, they'll say, oh, gross, disgusting. Those are common words they're going to do. It's also important for me to show the prep picture on the lower left side because it gives them the appreciation of how it got bigger and why we do an onlay in this case. And then you show a final picture on the lower right side. Now, I understand that, you know, if you talk to me in the past, okay, maybe in 10, 15 years ago, a lot of these cases that I'm talking about where I'm doing onlays and inlays now or three quarter crowns, typically in the past, I would have just done full crowns. Now, if you're comfortable with doing full crowns, um, then, you know, then that's fine. And you don't have to really show so much of the prep picture because it's just a crown. 
But since I do typically a lot of inlays and onlays, I really want to show the prep picture so the patient sees the difference in regards to why I'm not prepping into a full crown and why we need to use porcelain because the hole is relatively large. Now, in this case with Joshua, as you can see, he didn't change crown number you know, 15 or 27 in this case. But I can tell you that right now, once that 26 was done, Joshua is going to remember that 27. And you never know. Sometimes when Joshua is ready down the road, he will give us a call in regards to taking up care of that 27. So this is the reason why we keep on reinforcing with these photographs, at least for me, is to really have that conversation and to really let patients really understand why they need it. And again, to eliminate guesswork. So case number three now, case number three is quadrant work right now, okay? We started with a single two, we started with two T. Now we're gonna start with quadrant work now because as you can see, same picture as we saw at the very beginning, on the top, you have basically a cruzal decay on one eight, one seven, you have distal recurrent decay around the amalgam. You have basically breaking down composite, probably had decay underneath it and then most likely, you know, decay underneath the amalgam of that one four. No different from the bottom here, those two molars, which is two six and two seven, you can current decay there. Now, with me in this case, the conversation was started with the two seven because there's decay on the back portion of it, and you'll make that recommendations. But in this case, with Kathy, then she actually started asking me questions about other teeth, which was telling her that there was decay here on the fusel of that two, one eight, telling her that there was breakdown around that composite on one six, and another also filling of that on one four. So role play again. So I would say something, and Kathy, I just want to let you know on the x-rays, I saw decay on this molar here on the backside of it. And whenever there's decay, I recommend you to treat it just because it's just going to get worse. Ah, Kathy's going to say, what should you do about it and how are you going to fix it? I said, well, in cases like this, typically what I would do is I remove the silver filling and the decay, and the hole is going to be relatively on the larger side. And whenever it becomes on the larger side, typically I would like to use the material porcelain similar to a crown, but it's not going to be a full crown. Think of it as like a partial crown or an insert that we make and fit into that space, a custom piece. Ah, I see. And then uh, Kathy's going to say, well, how much is that going to cost? Well, the cost of that is going to be estimated around $1,300. Now, just assume Kathy doesn't have insurance in this case. And she's going to say, oh, okay. Then she, my, Kathy, in this case said, well, how about the surrounding teeth? Is the surrounding teeth looking okay? And I said, well, I just want to let you know, since we're here, I just want to point out to you that there's decay going on on this molar, third molar, some of your composite on your first molar is breaking down and your amalgam on this one on the left side is very similar to the one that's happening, what we're talking about. Then Kathy will say something like, well, should I do it? Should we take care of all of this? And I said, well, Kathy, in a perfect ideal world, it's nice to take care of it. Do you need to do it all at once? Absolutely no. But it's nice to do it all at once. The reason why it's nice to do it once is that, or at least in the same time, is because you only have to be injected only one time versus multiple times when you did separately, number one. Hence, you know it's worth injected because a lot of times people don't like the word injected. And number two, I say a lot of times, you know, when they get everything done, when, you know, when your lab makes these respirations for you, it's nice to really have them done at the same time because when they're side by side, it's just nicer to have these respirations done side by side at the same time. It's not necessary. Okay, and then Kathy then is going to say, well, what is the disadvantage? Well, the disadvantage is that the appointment that we do, if we do all of this, is going to be longer, and the cost is going to be more at the beginning. But I can tell you that right now, because of inflation, if we decide to do one tooth at a time, you know, down the road, total cost is going to be end up more. It's just that right now, your initial cost is a little bit more because you're doing all at once. Then Kathy is going to think in her head, because you already know that, oh, sorry, so I have skate was going to say, well, how are you going to fix all these teeth? And I will say, well, Kathy, we talked about a porcelain um, partial crown or insert here now, right? So I'll be doing something similar to this molar and this molar also. 
Now, the fact that I told her that it was $1,300 per tooth, or at least for that tooth, since I'm saying that would be treated the same way, she wouldn't be smart enough because most patients would be smart enough to start multiplying things in their head. So she'll be multiplying three times 1,300, which is $3,900, right? Plus composite, which is relatively smaller cost there. But in this case, it will be approximately $3,900 and a little bit more. Now, she's going to be thinking this in her head. And if she can really afford it, she's going to say something like, well, okay, fine. Can you give me a treatment plan for that? Or again, she's going to say things like, well, you know, um, do you offer payment plans? Or the third thing would be, does insurance cover it? And I'll say the same thing. Insurance does cover it, but just expect the copay to be a little bit more, to be more one tooth versus four teeth. So the whole idea is then get patients like Kathy to really think about to see if there's a value and benefit of doing it. And it's the same thing as the case on bottom here. It will be the same thing with this gentleman doing those two teeth from two six and two seven. And so at the end of the day, what happened is that Kathy decided to do the quadrant from one five, one four to one eight. Okay. Now, one thing I do want to stress also is that even though after you discuss the problems from these five or these four teeth, at the end of the day, Kathy might just want to take care of just one two. And if they do, the key here also is to make sure that you don't push them to treatment plan or treat, treat, treat push them to treatment for the other teeth also. Just back off. The key is to make sure that you don't feel like you're trying to push them to do anything. Because they already know what's the issue. But what's going to happen is that if they're only going to take care of one tooth only, what's going to happen is that somewhere down the road, either they'll be mentally ready, something's going to break, something's going to hurt, and I can guarantee you at that point, the first one they'll be calling is you because they remember you talked about it. And so you want patients to really come to you instead of you trying to persuade them to do any type of treatment. And that's been always my style now. And I just feel like in some ways, in a lot of ways, it's just a much better relationship. So again, now walking through because Kathy decided to take care of four teeth, right? So we want to walk them through the case again. You want to show them the decay on the occlusal surface of that 1A. You want to also show the primary cause of the problem, which is the decay on the distal portion of that 1-7. Not much decay underneath that composite 1-6, but again, decay underneath the silver filling on 1-4. Patients, again, like Kathy, will say, oh, man, that's gross and disgusting. And I will say something like, Kathy, I agree with you. And that's the reason why I recommend you have this treatment done because of decay like this. Just to reinforce that, basically, this is the reason why they need to do that. No different from the same thing below here on the 2.6 and 2.7. Very common things that you're seeing in practices, recurrent decay and then these serotonins. And by them looking at it, especially when you don't have pain, it reinforces the reason why they're doing it. To then show them the pictures of the prep pictures to, for them to appreciate that the size of these restorations were on the larger size. And that's the reason why I decided to do porcelain versus a filling. Because a lot of times, sometimes patients think about why can't you just fill the tooth? So in this case, the treatment plan at the end for Kathy on the top is composite on 1.8 and porcelain on one seven, one six, and one four. And on the bottom was porcelain on two six and two seven. And again, like I said, nowadays for me, I don't do a lot of full crowns unless it's absolutely necessary. You'll see me prep for these onlays and inlay cases sort of like this on a daily basis. Another thing, like I said earlier, was that when you get these respirations on the top right side, a lot of times I like the patient touch it and feel it is to reinforce exactly what they pay for. So at least they feel you know, they get bowed to that. So they can remember that, okay, I remember now. I didn't do a filling here. I did a piece of porcelain jewelry, porcelain art in this case. And then you want to also show them the final product so that there is value in what they, at least show them that what, that's what they pay for before and after. So that, you know, you get some happiness from that, that they managed to take care or take out all the old bad stuff. 
So then again, just a sequence of things. You want to show a series of pictures from pre-op to prep pictures with decay, final prep, and final cementation. Those are the main four pictures I usually walk through. Now, with Kathy, I just want to let you know that was just one quadrant. If we decide to do the next quadrant again, Kathy might not want to look at pictures anymore because they remember. So it is not uncommon that I noticed that when you work multiple quadrants on patients, a lot of times, a lot of times they remember because they trust you. A lot of times they will not even bother saying, ah, you don't have to show me anymore. So don't be surprised that you don't have to do that anymore. And part of this is because you built all that trust at the very beginning. Next case, hybrid, because that is basically the, the main um, the main reason why I just talked about the course last time is to really phase out, uh, to phase out the composites to sort of like to the custom inlays and stuff like that. So for me, uh, for the smaller or mid-sized type of restorations, I typically use a hybrid material, which is made of composite and porcelain. And if you look at it in picture number one, again, very typical um picture of a also fillings in all your patients uh, and it so happens that we decide to treat only two four and two five if you look at two four that's very probably typical composite preps maybe even two five also but nowadays for me i just don't do a lot of composites because i just phase them out part of it's because i'm just not very good at it and I just know that whenever I do indirects, it's very predictable. The contacts are good. The voids are minimal. And you know what? I do have a different price point where it basically allows me to really phase it out from the composite to the hybrid. So basically, again, I have three price points. I really don't do composites anymore. I, 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 I still tell them the estimate cost of that, but I tell them I don't do that. Um, but then... Hybrid cost is the mid-grade cost, and then I have my porcelain cost. And um, and that is sort of my technique of phasing out the composites. So one of the things that words that you want to use with these type of restorations is that you typically want to use things like, because patients will ask you, why can't you fill it? Or is it a filling and things like that? You will say something to Esmeralda in this case. I would say, Esmeralda, you know, uh, these are custom no restorations. Um, they are precision fit. It is a combination of composite and porcelain. Uh, it's much more accurate, it's stronger, and lasts longer. And I would usually use these words, and then I will compare it to versus things like composite. And think of composite as like ejecting material out of like a caulking gun. And really, it's true. And if you notice, I try to use words that patients understand. And the reason why I say that is because patients understand what a caulking gun is and what squirts out. And basically when it's squirting out a caulking gun, it's squirting to a hole in sets because that's really what a composite is. Versus I would say things like what I do for you is a custom piece that goes straight into that. It's a custom mill piece. It's a precision fit. And that's why it's better and stronger. So I will have these type of explanations and difference in explanations. And by doing that, I've noticed that a lot of times patients just typically will just go ahead with my composites. Sorry, no, my hybrids in this case. Now, at the end, don't be surprised. There are still some patients that might say composites, but nowadays for me, nowadays, because I really have phased them out, I would say things like, well, just want to let you know. Yes, if you still want to do composites, I don't do composites anymore, but if you want to do it, I can probably get someone like my associates to do it for you if you want to. So that's sort of the conversations I have now with my patients, uh, especially if still patients want to do composites. To a case I just did today, just before I came to this webinar, just want to let you know, this is 3-6. No, actually, this is 3-4-6, lower right molar. And so if you look at it on the top, you have an existing composite, heavy clencher and grinder with a worn or popped off composite or just worn out enamel. Now I can tell you that right now, this is a case that 10 years ago for sure, I will prep this for a full crown. And the funny thing is today when I came, when I came in for it, we were supposed to do a hybrid for him. Okay, again, that's a mid-grade product for me and mid-grade cost. And 
funny thing is that when I just put up the picture, he asked me about it. He goes, hey, Doc, um, just can you run by me? What are we doing today? And I said, well, we're going to use a uh, hybrid material today for something like this. He goes, well, I know you've done some portion of work on me in the past, but I, I'm a material guy and I just feel like, you know what? I want to use a stronger and better material. And I said literally like this to him today. I said, just want to let you know that I was going to do it in, compo in the hybrid in this case, um, but um, if you do want to do the porcelain, we can definitely switch that if that's what you want. The only thing is that I just need to make sure I have enough thickness height-wise for the porcelain, because if I don't have enough height for the porcelain, then it will chip and break. And so I said to him, if you really are focused on doing porcelain, once I start doing this, if I have the thickness of it, did you want to do it in porcelain? And he said, yeah, let's do it in porcelain. And so this is an example of me showing pictures again. And then you will have examples like this where basically patients will maybe change their mind by just looking at this and evaluating and have this conversation with them from, I would say, from maybe a pretty good restoration to, in this case, a more premium restoration because the patient wanted it. And that was an example of just from just showing pictures and showing patients what we did in the past to knowing you know, what's available out there. So again, like I said, the pictures does make a difference. And a lot of times you have cases like this where it went from one treatment to another treatment just by showing patient these existing restorations. So, now you understand the sort of like a really quick way of just learning how I talk to my patients. Let's talk about the economics now because you have to understand the economics here. So if you decide to, in this case, for Kathy, we basically worked on four teeth. So if you did one unit on two seven versus three plus units, okay? This is the difference here. Let's do some breakdown. And I'm just using my example, okay? The prep time for one unit for me, for you, it could be a little bit different, but it's gonna be very similar and you can sort of use this as a guide. The prep for me for one unit is around 20 minutes, but prep for these three units or more is around 40 minutes. Now, if I do digital impressioning, okay, it takes the same amount of time for digital impression, five minutes. Now, if you're gonna temporize it, since you're gonna have someone like Arn make it for you, it's prepping one tooth is going around 15 minutes, which by the way, could be a system doing it versus doing all these four temporaries or three temporaries in 20 minutes. Now, when the restorations come back, the bonding for three units is gonna be 30 minutes and bonding for the, sorry, bonding for one unit is 30 minutes and bonding for three units is gonna be 40 minutes. Now look at the total time. The total time for one unit is approximately 70 minutes versus 105 minutes, at least in my case, for three units or more because that composite on one eight. If you look at it, this is the big difference here, okay? The big difference is that if you did one unit based on a $1,300 unit, you're getting paid approximately $1,111 per hour, which is by the way, very good. Don't get me wrong, that's very good. Now, if you did three units or more, your production goes up to $2,228 plus with that composite. So I would say that in any given time, I wouldn't have any doctor say no to three units versus one unit. But the idea is to how to you can get patients to really go for the quadrant. And I've given you an idea of how to talk to patients to have that dialogue so that you can actually do more of these cases on a daily basis so that your productivity goes up. Now, don't get me wrong also, whenever ARM makes these restorations for you, it's better for them also. And I would say that I can probably speak for them that when they make restorations side by side, it's probably much more ideal for them to make a side by side versus one at a time. So this benefits on a lot of fun. It benefits for the patient as you get it done all once, you take care of the issue. Number two is that for you, there's more, there's more uh, efficiency for you. And then for our muscle efficiency on their side also. So there's a lot of benefits in why we do quadrant dentistry. 
Now, one of the things that also is that by talking to patients, notice that I talk to a patient in a certain way. Part of it also is me understanding patient's personality. And I typically use a disc profile. Now, there's many ways of, there's different systems out there to understand patient's personality. But what I mean by that is that when there's a personality difference, I typically will talk to patients differently based on the personality. I'm just gonna use two separate ones, D and C. D is a dominant type of personality and the dominant type of personality is one of the people that typically would get straight to the point. You want to know if it's needed or not, how much it's cost, how long it's gonna get done. Those are the dominant type of patients in this case. A C type of patient is typically dentists like dentists like ourselves. Uh, likes to go into details, like to know every step, like to know the cost of it, like to know how long it takes. And also after all that, you still need to think about it before you actually say yes. And so you just have to understand that because once you understand that, you will know how to communicate with the patient. So I'm going to give you an example, role play again. I'm going to be talking to a dominant person. Just say Kathy again. Because Kathy, I understand she's a dominant type of personality. I'll usually have the picture up again. And I'll usually say something like, hey, Kathy, that molar there, there's a decay in that tooth. Uh, um, I recommend to have it done. And then Kathy will say something like, oh, okay. Um, how are you going to fix it? I would say something like, well, in this case, because the preparation is going to be on a larger side, I'm probably going to end up doing a, a partial crown on you in porcelain. And then Kathy will say things like, okay, how much does it cost? It's going to be $1,300. And, and Kathy's going to think in her head exactly what's going to be needed. And then Kathy might say, well, how about the surrounding teeth? Is it going to be an issue? I said, well, in a perfect world, because I know these things are going to be a problem down the road, it's probably a good idea to get it done. And Kathy will say, are you going to do it in person also, for example? And I will say, yeah, most likely I'll be doing it in person. And so Kathy would multiply everything in her head and then she would say, okay, no problem. Can you give me a training plan and let's schedule this? That's sort of usually a dominant type of personality. Now with the C personality, the same one, Kathy, we'd be going through the same thing, but Kathy would be asking things like, well, how long is the appointment going to be? Then you'll be exactly breaking down the two, the two bits in regards to how long it's going to be. And she might say, ask you questions like, how are you going to actually prep the teeth? She's going to ask you that, for example, and you're going to explain to her that. And then she's also going to say, uh, how can I see a detailed treatment plan? She just doesn't want to just know the overall cost. She wants to see a detailed treatment plan, which means that you need to print a treatment plan detail for her. And she actually might look at the dental codes in this case. And then at the end also, Kathy might say, you know what? I have all this information. Can I really think about it and get back to you? And what... The key is for someone like that is that you need to appreciate that and respect that. And so you need to back off and not try to push Kathy to do it. Because if you try to push Kathy to do it, it's going to put her in an uncomfortable position. And that means that most likely she's not going to do it. So for someone like Kathy, I would say, geez, no problem. Take the time you need to think about it. And Kathy, when you're ready, please give us a call or just let us know that you're going to do it and we'll do it for you. So give you a time and a space to think about it. And, and once they're ready, they will come and get it done. And so this is an example of just understanding personality of patients and knowing how to talk to them and communicate with them. And you'll notice that by understanding that, you're probably going to have a lot better acceptance in your treatment plan also. So things to look out for and pay attention. One of the things that I do want you to pay attention is really do not sound or look desperate. Really don't, you know, I've noticed that the more I don't want it to do it for the patients, the more that patients want it. It's funny, once I shifted that, I've realized that everything comes so much easier. So don't sound desperate or don't look desperate. There's also going to be patients, by the way, there will be patients that believe you after you showing these things to them, okay? But they still may not want to proceed with treatment, okay? Because sometimes people are just not ready. So in this case, don't try to convince why they need it, okay? At some point in the future, either something is going to break, a tooth's going to break, or they're going to have pain to a particular tooth, or even the financial situation. A lot of times it's based on finances also. This financial situation is better. And when they are better, they're ready, 
the first one they'll be calling is you. Guarantee you that because you really present the case in a non-forceful way. Now, when patients don't want to do things or don't want to do it, you should say things like this. And I do this all the time. I tell them, hey, Kathy, it's okay. But I will notate this what, about what we talked about in my monitor list so that I can remember to check these areas every time you're in. But Nancy, I just want to let you know that if you ever change your mind and want to fix these issues, please let me and my team know. You want to say that because you want to always have Nancy keep us in their mind so that whenever they're ready, the first one they'll be calling is always us. And that's the reason why I say this all the time. So with this now, with all these role playing, have you noticed that I don't really talk about money and cost first? I don't talk about money. I always talk about the why first. If you do not talk about cost, don't worry about it because you know why? Patients will always ask you the cost once you've talked through and walked them through about why they need it in this case. Never talk about money, cost, or if the insurance will cover this. Never. We typically like to do that as dentists. We like to always tell them that. Don't. Just keep our mouth shut and don't say that. If you do, you will have a hard time getting patients to accept treatment because that's the first thing you think about is the money part. Always talk about the whys in this case. So now with that said now, now I do a lot of photography, okay? And yes, a, a lot of these cases is done by a digital SLR camera, a big camera with retractors and mirrors. And so, yes, I know that if you do that, you're going to have investment and cost and then learning how to use that also. So my goal is for you not to have that barrier for you. So I made it very easy for you if you want to get into this better pictures. All you need to do is just go to Amazon or wherever you want to get it, get things like cheap retractors, which you may have already. Another thing that I thought was a pretty smart idea is because when you use mirrors, a lot of times people breathe through it and fog it up. You have these anti-fog mirrors now by basically fan blowing at it with a light so that typically you could theoretically hold it by yourself or your assistant can hold it while you take a picture. And then I know all of us has nice phones now, iPhones or Androids, or at least you have these older ones that you don't have anymore. And all you need to do is that if you want to hold it on a tripod with a little button to activate it, you can do that. Or if not, then you can hold basically the anti-fog mirror one hand and then use the iPhone to take pictures. And then nowadays with the iPhone, you can take these quadrant pictures. And so as a start, it's very easy and very inexpensive for you to get into this. But later on, as you get better and better and you want better pictures, then of course, go get the SLR cameras in this case. But what I'm trying to tell you is that you don't have to do what I'm doing now. All you need to do is just get a simple setup like this and you can get going with these nice quadrant photos. Now, with that said, uh, we can get into a little bit fancier stuff. You can get to digital impressioning. And for me, I just, I do have the CEREC, but I also have the Atero. But, you know, I know that with ARM, they work the Atero and Meta also. And so another way of presenting cases is using digital impressioning instead of doing quadrant pictures. So what are the benefits of really digital impressioning? The good thing about it is that you or the system can do it. Um, whenever you do cases, the great thing about it is that really there's no shipping cost outbound to ARM, for example, because it's immediate through the internet and there's no packaging. Basically, ARM gets the file within minutes and then they can literally get cut down the lab time by maybe turning around that restoration much faster. And I can tell you this right now, and my ARM can probably back me up on this, is that the more digital scan you do, there's a proven fact that there's more accuracy and there's less remake versus taking impressions. Like I said earlier, there's a faster lab turnaround time. You can get, get case sooner, less chair time, and there's less carbon footprints because there's less shipping and packaging anymore. So that's more environmentally friendly. But what I do use now also with the Artero is that it is a better, a better educational tool. And the reason why that is that I will have something like this where basically we or me or the assistant will scan it and I will walk through this. The great thing about the digital scanning is that you can basically walk through the whole case with the patient at one time versus going through 
each picture at a time. Another thing you can do is you can spin in all directions and you can show patients really the issues. In this case, with that broken root there, the extent of that broken tooth in three dimension, you can see the depth of it. And so that might be the reason why maybe you can't save that tooth. You can also show, start showing that there's multiple decay going on on other areas. And this is an example of me presenting and walking through this case with Michael actually, and it became a full mouth case. And actually started with just going through a walkthrough with the general impression instead of pictures. We just did this. And so this is another technique that I do nowadays um, instead of photos. And, um, and, and it's just great. Now, the only thing I'm not too crazy about this is that the look is still cartoonish. But the great thing about it is that with the Artero, you can still magnify, you can see sort of like a digital imaging on the lower right side. And the top right side is just basically a care detector. So, I mean, there's a lot of benefits from using these tools also. Again, I'm not getting paid from this line for Itero, so I'm not endorsing because I'm getting paid this, but this is something that I've been, I'm naturally using on a regular basis because I find this to be quite effective for these larger cases, okay? And then what I can do also is that you can take snapshots of these different images and you can sort of notate this. And the, light, the good thing about this is that when I notate this is that after I do this, I can get my staff to email it to Mike. And what happens is that you realize that a lot of times when the patient leaves, there's hundreds of things going on in life. And you know what? The teeth may not be the most important thing. But what happens is that when you email this to the patient of Mike, maybe on his downtime, he decides to look at the email again. And then he looks at these images. And what happens is that as he looks at it, it will reinforce the issues with what he has. And don't be surprised again that he understands why you're discussing this treatment proposal that he might at some point come to you and say, you know what, I'm ready to go. Can we start working a treatment plan based on what we talked about? And so this is the benefits of digital impressioning. Another thing that I like with digital impressioning also is that if I want to get something like ARM to print something for me or do some digital wax up, I can export that file to an SDL file to have it printed. Or if you have a printer yourself, you can do it yourself. Another thing I like about it is that in Invisalign, of course, the main thing is about orthodontics. In this case, you can do actual a virtual simulation of before and after. You can literally show the patients what can be done before and after. And literally, it gives them the ability to visualize in the spot to really decide and make decisions um, on much easier. And again, like I said, I'll take a screenshot of it and I'll start writing notations and things like that. And then I'll have an email to the patient if they need to think about it. You can see exactly what's done before and after. And so this is sort of just an example of the power of just using digital impressioning now versus photographs. You know, um, in some ways it's a better tool to communicate with patients, especially for these big cases. But don't get me wrong, I mean, if I don't have the ability to do that, I still do things like this. I still do photography. And in this case, it happens to be a case I'm working on right now. I didn't get digital impressioning. We still have photos and I would label the numbers and give patients a summary. The key to that, again, is that when I do stuff like this, patients will be able to see exactly what's going on. And then with that, with the notations that or a summary that you give them, they can really digest this and understand it without you trying to sell them cases. And I just found out, again, using digital impressioning and these type of photographs, it's just a much easier way to treat plan and much easier for people to accept. So take a home, take away. So what's your takeaway? The number one thing is that if you're not doing this right now, really consider taking quadrant photos or digital impressioning if you want to invest into something better. But at least if you don't, keep it simple, take quadrant photos. Number two, really let the patient absorb what's in the photos, okay? And, or the scan, and really let them talk first and walk through and let them ask questions on what they see. And then in this case, after that, 
Don't talk about the money. Talk about really what it benefits and what can be done and why is, and why we're doing this. Now, if the patient is not ready for treatment, don't try to convince them, okay? But if they're ready, they eventually will ask you how much things going to cost. And once they ask you how much things cost, if they're ready for it, then basically going to start treatment. If not, then they're going to wait around. And then eventually, I can guarantee you that once they wait long enough and they trust you, they will come around. You just have to understand that with the quadrant and single tooth, it doesn't really take that long for people to come around to do it. For big cases, small cases, complex cases, patients usually need time to think about it. And don't be surprised if it takes them months. The picture before that, I tell you that that was at least six or seven months before you came around and talked to me and said, hey, I'm ready. So I'm just letting you know that just wait. Eventually, you know, they're going to come around and call you. With that said, I know that if you're interested also in restoring implants with Roto, which is basically no cement and screw, uh, there is uh, online, like manual from A to Z. Definitely you don't have that yet. Dan, we email that to you. Uh, it's a pretty cool way of restoring implants without screws and cement. And again, it's all about the, you know, the partnership between your labs and your doctors. It's about that for success. With that said, if you need to contact me, please leoyandds at gmail.com. That's the best email. Or with any type of lab or roto needs, please contact Dan at danielm at armgroup.com. Sorry, I think I ran behind schedule a little bit longer. I got too excited. Thank you everybody for staying around today and open to any questions. I see one question is right now. I'm gonna stop the video. Oh. All right, I'll share. Thanks, Leo. That was so, great. Some really good tips on uh, changing some of the language involved uh, to convince people on the treatment acceptance, as well as just how important photos and things like that are to help gain that acceptance as well. Um, we do have that one question here. Um, and it is, what material are you using for your inlays and onlays? Uh, what level of translucency? And as well as, uh, what are you bonding with? Okay, so Murray, uh, Dr. Murray, um, for, so there's three categories. I, there's, so the crowns is typically either going to be Emacs or zirconia for me, but I'm still an Emacs guy. For my onlays, for my big onlays, I typically will use still Emacs. And Emacs have different levels of translucency from low translucency to medium translucency to high translucency. So a lot of times if you end up using Emacs as your onlays, typically the aesthetics is quite nice. Now, I haven't tested Emacs. Can you hear me? Sorry. You can hear me, right? Yeah, I haven't tested a zirconia for inlays and onlays, so I can't really speak on that, but I'm very comfortable using Emacs for my onlays. Now, for my inlays, I use a hybrid material, like I said today in my last lecture or this webinar. Uh, hybrid is made from several companies to composite and person together, and I believe ARM uses Vita Dynamic, and I can tell you that with Vita Dynamic, there's different levels of translucency, and there's different grades of shade within that block that they can mill out of. And I can tell you that the translucency is very nice. It blends right in. So um, uh, I would say that for my inlays now, it's typically a hybrid material such as V-Dynamic, or in this case, I might use something like GC ServSmart also. And in regards to bonding, I do bond everything. I just want to let you know, okay? Because there's a difference between bonding and looting. So I bond everything, which means that there's a chemical bond between the tooth and the restoration. Um, I feel like with a lot of bonding rest, uh, bonding resin cement out there, a lot of them are pretty good. The one I tend to use nowadays is just the Panavia V5, V5. And that, in my opinion, is just something I like. But there's a lot of companies out there, such as the Ivoclars, the 3Ms, and other companies like that, that produces pretty good resin cement. And I would say at the end of the day, they all do a pretty good job. It's a matter of what you like in this case. Perfect. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Yang. Um, if there's any more questions, you can put them into the question and answer bubble there. 
Um, what I might just do now is share my screen and put on those QR codes for everyone to be able to access their uh, CE. Oh, can I just uh, get you to unshare your screen quickly, Dr. Yang? Perfect, thank you. Perfect. So we have up right now the uh, QR code to get the CE points. It'll be send you to a quick survey. I'll leave that up for a few moments. All right, and now change it over. And this one goes to the Orem Academy webpage where you can find out uh, future webinars that we're putting on as well as other events that uh, Orem presents. Perfect. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Oh, and it looks like we have another question. Oh, sure. just Marie answered us and said, uh, beautiful work. Thank you for sharing. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate you staying around, guys, everyone, for uh, the talk today. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, with that, if there's no more questions, we'll call this a session. And I look forward to seeing everyone on our next uh, webinar with the Orem Academy. Thank you. Thank you.